not music. <laughs> For a minute at a time With John and Will And I guess you just rhyme It's Bad Minute Hello and welcome once again to Bat Minute Forever The podcast where we once again are intercepting the messages from the big giant head uh, in Joel Schumacher's 1995 Batman Forever movie, one minute at a time. I'm saying that because it's got one of those big giant heads behind Nicole Kidman, and I couldn't <laughs> think of anything anything else to quote from this uh, this particular piece of the film. Uh, I am one of the hosts, Niall McGowan. And bringing the vinyl and whips, it is John Parker, your other host. Uh, and we have, uh, today we're joined once again, uh, returning guest from previous two seasons and just this last episode, yep. uh, Molly Balin from Cabin Minute Cast and Escape from New York Minute. Woo! Yay! <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Hi, guys! <laughs> Are you happy, Molly, that you've managed to get a minute that has one of the giant heads that you're just floating around Gotham <laughs> looming in the background? I love the giant heads! Yes! I'm super stoked about the giant heads. I'm delighted every time I see a weird gothic giant head. I, I really feel that, because I remember the, one of the ones we really talked about, like, in the previous movie, is when, like, Max Shrek got, you know, abducted by the penguin, because he stops right next to this big giant head. And I think we might have even had last season, where we might have joked around, like, oh, it'd be great if, like... The city absorbed the souls of people, and that they became the faces on the wall. I would love if that was a giant Chris Walken head behind her, and it's like Max Shrek has been claimed by Gotham, so it's just this big giant Chris Walken face, just like like um, like Joni in Twin Peaks in the in the 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 the, the knob of the door or the the, yeah. the cabinet or whatever. It's just Walken screaming face. It's like, oh no, Gotham has claimed another victim. That would have been the best Easter egg ever to have done that. <laughs> you know, it looks pretty droopy eyes. Maybe it is walking. You never know. <laughs> like, we, we, we can make it headcanon that it is. So, like, yeah, that's mm-hmm. him. That's Max Shrek's ghost. Um, of course, yeah. Uh, but, of course, yeah, today we're here to talk about uh, Minute 20 of Batman Forever. And Minute 20 uh, begins with the, you know, Chase Meridian turning up the heat on this rooftop. And uh, it ends a minute later with uh, Jim Carrey giggling at something or other um how original (laughs) again though this moment of her like oh taking off the coat and revealing the lingerie and stuff when i was a kid did nothing for me but now i'm like oh (laughs) this is like i'm I'm feeling batman's pain here but like this 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 is something like you know he i don't understand him been very torn in this situation but uh, (laughs) he's doing well at conveying that to be honest because he does look very interested in his face. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. he's, he's trying not to give it away, but he's giving it away. I thought I was also intrigued by what she's saying, though, in that, like, because uh, she says, like, oh, you know, um, I'll bring the wine, you bring your scarred psyche, which is, like, it's indicating that she's, like, attracted to, like, damaged people, I guess. Yeah, that's not yeah. healthy for anyone. Yeah, I know there are people like that, though, who are like, you know, cycles of abusive relationships and stuff, because they, they always have that thing of like, I can fix I can fix him or I can fix her and stuff like that. And it always ends badly. Maybe Chase Meridian for, you know, all the much like Harley Quinn for all the intelligence and the, you know, the knowledge of psychology. She can't see the forest for the trees in her own behavior. Mm, and stuff. Right, right. Because you can't see past your own blind spots. Um, yeah. Just after the release of Joker, I, I saw a meme going around. I think it was on Twitter or something, where so, like some woman was uh, just talking about like what, sitting watching the Joker, just like she just put like me dot dot dot. I can fix him. And I think it was just, oh, just the joke and the fact that it's like no, you're not supposed to be thinking that at all when no. you're watching the Joker. <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> no, no. I, yeah, that one's that one's passed. But you know, kind of like we were talking about uh, last episode that you know with Charles Manson getting married. Uh, beforehand, I mean, uh, Ted Bundy is an infamous serial. I don't. Do you guys know who Ted Bundy is? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. mentioned yeah, last I mean, movie actually as well at one point. Uh, Bruce Wayne yeah. talks about Ted, but Ted Bundy very briefly. Yeah, 
Yeah, he, so you know, he had he had girlfriends. He uh, yeah. had a woman even you know during trial who agreed to to marry him. So there there's yeah. definitely you know women who believe that they can step in and either don't believe or are really really attracted to that level of screwed up. So mm. uh, yeah, I think this is professional for her, but it's also. You know, I think she's got a dynamic here that, you know, maybe she feels like, because I, I don't even know that she wants to really fix him. I think she's just kind of like a, like, fetishy, horny, middle-aged lady who just wants to, like, you know, this is kind of, uh, it's like big game for her. Mm. Mm. <laughs> yeah, it's the hunt. Because if she did Green fix Arrow, him. I got through Superman, now I moved on to Batman. <laughs> the biggest game of them all <laughs> we talked about this a few minutes ago um if she did fix him so like as we keep suggesting then surely she wouldn't actually be interested in him anymore well that's, that's actually one of the things that like mm. um like yeah i'd be intrigued by that idea like so yeah once he's like a once he's fixed would, would the attraction go away and it reminded me as well of and um i was always really curious about it, like after suicide squad came out because some people were just like oh the best part was when you know, at the end, Enchantress is showing everyone what they really want and what they could have and stuff. And because oh, yeah. Harley Quinn's vision is just like the Joker and her as normal people with a normal family and stuff. No, I didn't. And I was, yeah, and I was at the time like going, I think even like the DC Cinematic Minute guys were like, oh yeah, that, that, that's true to Harley's character. And it's like, you know, any version of Harley Quinn I've ever seen, like Harley Quinn is very happy in who she is. And she loves the Joker, like in terms of he's freed her and... He's brought her into this world of a complete insanity and yeah, you know, just be, like, be, you know, free falling being yourself and stuff, free balling she, being yourself. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sometimes she does want a kid and stuff, but it's not in a normal way. Yeah, they they, they have been like it was just Jared, Jared Leto in a suit, like he was going out to work in the bank or something. And mm-hmm. I was like, this is, but I know people who are like obsessed with the Joker, like you know, like they fetishize the Joker. Like back in like the the Dark Knight days and stuff, and they were like, "Oh, that was a scene I always wanted to see." Like, I did so special. And I was like, "That doesn't ring true to the character at all to me." Because then, what would be the attraction to the Joker if she could just get any old freaking guy? Like, what's yeah? Like, right. She's attracted to him. She's not attracted to some dweeb and a freaking you know. Oh, I'm going out to uh, going out to the green grocers, honey. Do you need anything <laughs> back? You know, it's, it seemed crazy to me. But oh well, we're not here to, to talk about the many. Many problems of Suicide Squad. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same kind of thing, though. Like, if you know, they're similar characters in some ways, I mean, they come from the same background, Chase and Harley. You know, they both have similar mm. jobs. Oh, that actually reminds me one thing we brought up last week. And in doing a little digging, uh, by crazy coincidence, I was like, oh, oh my God, what are, the, what are the odds of that? Apparently, in the early stages of development, Molly, um, Joel Schumacher originally wanted Poison Ivy to be in this movie. Mm. And he specifically wanted Nicole Kidman, the player. And then eventually he was like, nah, too many characters, too much going on. I'll just cut out Poison Ivy altogether. And we were kind of joking, like, oh, wouldn't it be something of, like, basically Chase Meridian was just Poison Ivy. He just went through and changed the name, everything, just tipexed out <laughs> Poison Ivy and put in Chase Meridian. But I was going into, like, oh, you know, in the comics, has there ever been someone who's just got to the top of the, you know, police department and turned on the bat, the bat signal just to meet up with him? Oh, and yeah. just to, just to have a chat. I was like, oh, yeah, it did happen one time. There was a woman who wanted to meet up with him. It was Poison Ivy. <laughs> I was like, oh, my God, what are the odds? So, again, wow. Legends of the Dark Knight uh, 42 in the, the, the story house Hot House. Uh, sorry, the storyline Hot House. Uh, yeah, Poison Ivy, who's, you know, at that point, she's Pamela Isley. She's supposed to have gone straight and stuff. Uh, she calls Batman by the bat signal as a, as a false alarm just to say, like, I just want to talk to you and stuff. And he and says so. the bat signal is not a beeper. Tragically <laughs> enough, they didn't have Oscar-winning screenwriter Akiva Goldsman there to to pump up the the script for them. But, if only, but just seemed like oh, that's, maybe maybe this was all just like oh, we were originally planning Chase Meridian to become Poison Ivy or <laughs> something along those lines. That's where the character was born from. That would but be fun if, like, it, in like, the next movie, she becomes Poison Ivy. Yeah, mm. oh, totally. I could totally see that. Like, they could have just you know, you could have had this film where it was like you could get rid of. Like, uh, get rid of Edward Nigma. Just have it be like, oh no, <sighs> and, and then she, she, she teams up with you know Batman, spurns Chase Meridian, and she becomes Poison Ivy. It would be a weird flip on the Catwoman dynamic mm-hmm. of the last movie to have like, oh, Batman's like outright rejecting this woman who's completely in love with him, and then she becomes this crazy city conquering supervillain and stuff to get back at him and things like that. That's but. far too interesting for this. <laughs> <laughs> 
But you, I think you've hit on like a huge point because it's interesting when even reviewing these minutes, I was thinking like, gosh, like her character just seems so much like Poison Ivy <laughs> and Uma Thurman in the next movie where, you know, she's already set up like, and especially from last minute, we were talking like her like man crushes from back in the day were totally Dick Grayson to a T and you have that complete dynamic in the next movie with... Poison oh, yeah. Ivy, like playing off both Batman and Robin sexually. Yeah. And here we've completely set up the template. So I agree with you, Niall. If they would have just like owned that and, you know, made her basically a Pamela Isley and, you know, I is it Isley or Ivy? Isley. Isley. Okay, thank you. And they just would have honored that. And then, yeah, have her be spurned and like hook up with Two-Face and just basically stomp Gotham. Like how amazing would that have been? And they could have just completely not have tried to, you know, rinse, repeat this storyline in the next movie and just honor it. Worked as well in that, like in the animated series before Harvey Dent becomes Two-Face, there's an episode where Harvey Dent is dating Poison Ivy and stuff. Like he doesn't know it's Poison Ivy at that point. But the guy has a whole thing. So you could have had a whole, like, that, that's, that's been done in Batman before to have Two-Face and a form of Two-Face and Poison Ivy hooked up. So they could have been wow. like, oh, we're, you know, uh, enriching that storyline and stuff. You've upset mm-hmm. me, though, because now I really need that. Mm. And mm. the movie, this movie won't be as fun. <laughs> no. Remember, remember, though, in the, the Patreon episode, John, we did of uh, Almost Got Him. They have a great allusion to Two Faces and Poison Ivy's relationship. Yes. Where she's just like, uh, like, oh, hello, Harvey. And he's just like, oh, half of me wants to strangle you to death. And she's like, oh, what about the other half? He wants to hit you with a truck. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, just, I, just, I just really, really love that line. You could have put uh, that line in this potential Batman Forever we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, could have had Two-Face back in the fourth movie. Two-Face and Arnold hooking up. It would have oh been amazing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that would have been... There should be a villain who runs throughout each of them, and he'll mm. he'll sort of go and get other villains to help him each time. So say Two-Face is the thread. Mm. So Two-Face can just... You know, in this movie, he can pick up Poison Ivy. It fails. So in the next movie, he goes and picks up... Uh, uh, Arnold, you know, mm-hmm. uh, not that his character's called Arnold, but <laughs> <laughs> he's Arnold. <laughs> like, it's, he, it's he's much. Arnie. He's always Arnie. I'm not. I'm not calling him his character name because it's Arnie. <laughs> but that would be cool. And then he can never quite get Two Face. He's going to come back next time with a yeah. new villain. It's like we'll meet again, Batman. <laughs> she says to him, "You like strong women. I've done my homework." So. Like, is she acting this way solely to bed him? Like, it's a put on, a ruse. Because to me, that implies like, oh, I've looked into him. This is what he likes. So I'm going to do that. And there's nothing less sexy than somebody like tailoring their entire personality just for you. That's weird. It's mm. creeperish. It's, it's, it's like stalking. Mm. Yeah, that's that's fair enough. Yeah. I do think, though, because she's so owning it all. I do think that maybe like she was like, oh, that might have even been part of the attraction to him. It's like, oh, he likes strong women too. Like I don't mind, and that's me. Yeah, I don't mind getting down and dirty with uh, with any two and stuff like that. So I'm mm. hoping that's the case. That like, you know, she, that that's part of the reason why she's she's interested in him. But I like that. That makes it more palatable. Hmm. But it's um. Although also as well because this is the now our direct allusion to the fact that this is a sequel to Batman Returns. Like it doesn't feel like it most of the time. But uh, but yeah, it's weird as well though because it's like how do how does she know about Catwoman and Batman's relationship? She might oh be my like, yes. that's my note, yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> we see like in the next in the next minute, you see like the Teen Mag Gotham beat. Is Gotham meat dishing on like what who Batman's dating nowadays or something? Like what's going on? How would it's they know that Batman was ho- hooked up with or had any interest in? Does he give interviews now? It's it's Gordon, but like, oh, me and him talked, and he totally told me he was into Catwoman and stuff. (laughs) It's got to be something like that, right? Because as far as the public knew, he just stopped her. Like, and that's about it. (laughs) As far as the public knew, is that Catwoman was around for a bit, and then she just disappeared. Unless he comes out and flat out says, like, yes, she she killed Max Shrek, and I think herself, maybe? But (laughs) I don't know, couldn't find a body. But uh, yeah, it just seems like you wonder, like in yeah, in Gotham Beat, just like Barbara Gordon was one of the writers for it or something, and then Jim Gordon was giving her an interview, and he's like, "Oh, I mean, no, nobody knows Batman like me, let me tell you." <laughs> and he's really into skin tight vinyl and a whip. <laughs> <laughs> 
And then it's just like this Gordon's trying to convince people that he actually has an in with Batman, where the last time we saw him talking was just like, oh, I think the circus gang's back. Well, we'll see. And just Batman's storming <laughs> off. And like, oh, no, we're and best it, friends. We're best friends. He's literally not spoken to him between the two movies either. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's why he's so desperate in this minute to meet up with Batman. Like, oh, crap. He's actually here. I can get talking to him. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be a first. A conversation with the Bat. Although, actually, uh, there is one kind of big thing that they... Um, deleted i was even having to check to see if they might even have shot the scene and cast the part and stuff but uh within both the original bachelor's draft and the akiva goldsman like production draft uh because uh, you know as we alluded to that there's a lot of shifting around of scenes and stuff Mm. so there was a a major sequence where bruce wayne learns again i guess how much (laughs) chase meridian is into batman uh it's a pretty interesting scene um Mostly, well, not mostly, but but it is also a kind of alluding to a, a kind of Dark Knight Returns reference in that Bruce is watching the television and people are commenting on what's been happening throughout the action of the film and stuff. Yeah, I'll, I'll just try to quickly read it out here because I thought that was pretty interesting. It says, like, on the TV screen, a radiant black host, Vondell Millions, obviously a spin on Montel Williams. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Talks to a panel of experts. An image of the disfigured Lady Gotham over, um, over oh, it's, it's always a, over his shoulder. For some reason, I thought Von Dell Millions was a woman, but um, anyway. So Von Dell says, like, just join us. We're talking about the horrible mutilation of Lady Gotham, the destruction of the statue's face caused late last night by Batman. Will and then Bruce watching goes like, excuse me, and then Von Dell continues with, may take up to nine months to repair. Today's topic: understanding the bat. And reveals the panel. Like uh, we have a distinguished guest of a uh, panel of experts, uh, and then Bruce says, "Oh, how about Harvey? Anybody heard of him?" Uh, I'm presumably saying this to Alfred. Uh, and it says, "Like on the, our first expert is Doctor Janislaus Royce, mm. a rent-a-bore type with a goatee and tiny hip glasses, uh, is spouting off with extreme confidence." And Royce says, "Batman is unable to reveal himself. He can't let any other human being enter into his comfort zone." And therefore, he can't allow an icon such as Lady Gotham to extend her own symbolic comfort across the city. The second guest, Dr. David Ames, fat, pompous, says, <laughs> it, it, he says, uh, you don't go far enough. It is criminals such as Batman who belong behind bars, not his morally disadvantaged victims. Uh, and Vondel says, like, so you're saying that, that Batman incites crime? Uh, and Roy says, exactly. He places himself above the law, above the justice system. And then Vondel says, like, I'm sure our audience would like to would object to your continual gender bias, that person, which is like very kind of like, that's almost like it'd be like someone you put in a modern movie is some kind of vindictive piss take almost in a, in a weird way. <laughs> then AIM says, Batman had no court order, no arrest warrant, no hard evidence that Harvey Two-Face ever posed a public threat. Absolutely insane. Um, yeah, hang on, what? <laughs> yeah, Batman drove uh, this cosmetically impaired individual into a reckless action. Batman <laughs> must take responsibility for that. And then a new female voice cuts across from off screen, Chase Meridian, saying, Bullshit. Uh, the panel are shocked into silence. Von Dell says, What did you say? And she says, I said, Bullshit. All of you are full of it. Uh, and then Bruce watching says, I could like this woman. On the TV screen, then uh, Chase says, Batman is a reaction to crime in the city, not a creator of it. The criminals, remember them, are the ones with no regard for life, liberty, or happiness of Gotham citizens. Uh, Von Dell says, Hey, Chase, you got the hots for Batman? And hoots and hollers from the audience. Bruce enjoys it. Uh, close <laughs> oh, in on Chase, on Chase on TV, busted. Uh, and then that's the end of that scene. But the, I just thought that was kind of a... Uh, that does add in like a new element, though, into the film of like the public once again turning on Batman. Because <laughs> it's like, hmm. I can't catch a break. They turned on, him, turned on him in the last movie. They didn't even like him in the first movie until the freaking end. They're so very, they're, very quick to turn on him. Yeah, just drop, drop of a hat, drop of a bat. They'll freaking oh. turn on this guy. It's because he's weird. <laughs> <laughs> so contextually, where does that um, that scene happen? That would have been straight after the whole the the helicopter coming into the Lady Gotham's face, basically. Oh, okay. Uh, and then they replace it in the film with like people going, "Oh, after you know, after a valiant attempt by Batman, indicating that the public does still like him and they don't blame him for it and stuff." Yeah. But mm. then, uh, in that at that point, the scene with Edward Nigma was the first scene of the movie. So, and then that's why, again, because this scene's supposed to come off like freaking 40 minutes from now and stuff. Like, mm. so a lot of shifting around things in the edit and stuff. Yeah. Um, 
but uh, but yeah, I think that was there maybe to sort of introduce the idea that Chase Meridian is willing to put her credentials on the line to fight for Batman. And maybe mm-hmm. after his whole when he first met her and was like, this woman freaking grabbed my hand and introduced me, introduced herself to me when I was trying to deal with Two Face. And what the hell is that about? <laughs> it might have been an indication of him softening towards her and stuff. But uh, mm. instead, we get this scene instead. So we get the great sleazy saxophone music in this scene. Oh, yeah. <laughs> which makes me feel like I'm in One-Eyed Jacks of Twin Peaks. <laughs> That's dirty saxophone, that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I do like, again, the, the Chase Meridian theme as well, with like the, mm. the, the, the plinketing uh, piano and whatnot, too. But uh, we're hearing a lot of that as, as the movie goes on. <laughs> But yeah, it also would be remiss if we didn't mention the fact that um, Chase Meridian here is making a reference to Catwoman. And of course, the, the what's going to be the new Catwoman is, of course, of course uh, Zoe Kravitz. And after Tom Cruise, Nicole Kidman dated Lenny Kravitz, Zoe Kravitz's dad, oh. for, for a couple Ooh. of years. So. Everything's connected. Yeah, in a weird way, like she would have been, uh, she could have been Catwoman's stepmom if, if things had worked out. <laughs> but, uh, oh my God, that'd be amazing. Like, although, what, what, how do you feel about the Zoe Kravitz casting, um, Molly? Are you? My one thing is that, like, I've, <laughs> I've seen Zoe Kravitz in many films. I can never remember that I've seen her in them because she's never made any kind of impact in my life. So it's, it's always, I kind of feel like I don't know if she's got the the chutzpah to to, to to own that role. I think she's a bit wallpapery, kind of in a weird way. But you know, I. I, I want to like her in that role. And I, I mean, I, I, I know she did X-Men. And again, it was kind of like, eh. And, you know, did Fury Road. And you're like, eh. But mm. yeah, she's just... Michelle Pfeiffer is the gold standard of Catwoman. And we just have not seen anybody hold a candle to that. And and it is a, it's a high bar to hit. And I would love to see her hit it, you know? I mean, I... There's a part of me that just feels like... If this was like 2005, you know, and or 2009, and you're talking about like Twilight, and then it's those actors who are like all coming up now as like kind of A-list in the mm. context. And that's, for me, I think at my age, a little bit challenging in that I, I haven't seen the gravitas of these actors be able to pull off these roles yet. And so I, I have a lot of trepidation. You know, I'm willing to be wrong. I've been wrong about before. I'm, I'm happy to be wrong. But mm. I definitely haven't seen anything that tells me that that's going to be able to be pulled off. Yeah. So. Yeah. That's fair enough. That's fair enough. Uh, uh, well, fingers crossed. You never know. As we've said before, nobody wanted Heath Ledger to yeah. be in a Batman movie. Nobody wanted yeah. Michael Keaton. But at the same yeah. time, like... Heath Ledger was coming off Brokeback Mountain when he was cast as the Joker. Like Zoe Kravitz is coming out like, oh, she's in Big Little Lies. I was like, I've seen season one of that. I don't remember her being in the show. But. Yeah. 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 I think Lisa Bonet would have made a better Catwoman. Oh, yeah. Back in the day. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, they did like, yeah, Dark Knight Returns kind of era Batman. Good. And Lisa Bonet. Maybe they could do that. Actually have like Zoe Kravitz plays her at this point of her life. And then, like, the next movie, they recast, and, like, it's an older guy playing Batman. We're doing Dark Knight Returns. Mm-hmm. And then they bring in Lisa Monet to play, like, an old Catwoman or something. Mm-hmm. That would be, that'd be pretty interesting. But uh, I know a lot of people are also saying as well that it might be a bit of uh, nepotism, because apparently Jason Momoa, you know, Aquaman, is her stepdad currently. So, mm-hmm. like, oh, oh, so, no, she's, getting, uh, she's getting Catwoman, and she, she knows a guy who's hooked up to the whole thing. But that's unfair to assume that anything would be. Yeah, plus be he's hardly the biggest actor going is he i mean he's aquaman but he was yeah. in game of thrones for five minutes <laughs> <laughs> let's not forget he was conan everyone does forget that he was conan, uh, but he was yeah. conan for, for i happily time. forgot that he was conan <laughs> yeah. but um but anyway uh <laughs> back to the minute yeah um, well back in the minute you know th- as things heat up gordon bursts onto the scene in his pajamas <laughs> <laughs> oh, now I'm ready to blow, baby. So that's the thing. Like things were getting sexy, and then they just kept getting sexier when Gordon shows up. You can't stop this scene. Oh my god, Gordon! I do like to think that like we're misreading what happened here, and it was actually like Gordon and Chase Meridian were both trying to entice Batman into a threesome. And he's just late, <laughs> so he's coming up there. Yes. 
And she actually stole all his lines. He's going to be like, you know, maybe you just haven't met the right type of man, Batman. <laughs> <laughs> I've done my homework. You like strong, you know, strong women. Do I need vinyl and a whip and stuff? <laughs> Oh my god, I need to see Gordon in vinyl in a way. <laughs> oh my god. Talk about entertaining. No, I, I love that he kind of comes in and kind of cock blocks this whole situation. <laughs> mm. Totally rude. It's a bit C-3PO, actually, in uh, Empire Strikes Back. <laughs> <laughs> I also love the fact that, like, does Gordon, does he live in the police station? Why is he in his pajamas? Well, he's got the pajamas and the hat on, but it's just like, how? so he literally didn't even take the time to put on, like, a pair of trousers and a shirt or something? He's like, no, straight... <laughs> Probably in well, the friggin' slippers and everything, as far as we know. I love the way you saw, because of our history of Gordon in these movies, you saw it negatively. Like, oh, he must live in this damn police station, the loser. <laughs> Whereas I, I thought it seemed good. I thought, weirdly, this showed Gordon at least being partially effective for the first time ever. Because he, <laughs> he noticed that signal had been lit without his knowledge. Mm. He saw that out of his bedroom window or something. And he jumped out of bed and he came all the damn way down here in his sleepwear. That's dedication to the job. <laughs> well, again, he, you know, he wants to convince his daughter that he's best friends with Batman. <laughs> so you know, somebody's <laughs> talking to him. <laughs> One other thing as well, though, I thought was quite strange. And I'll just point it out just because for the sake of pointing it out. But, like, this bat signal moves. Like, it goes... It like, rotates around and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Now, like in previous bat bat signals, it was always static. And uh, would it moving around a little bit improve its visibility to Batman in some way? Uh, I guess you'd notice something moving in the sky more than something static. Because hmm. it, it'd catch your eye a bit more, wouldn't it? Like, oh, what's that? Yeah. Well, maybe, maybe. Uh, but yeah, I was still just have the vision of Gordon coming up and being like, oh, I'm in his head planning how this was going to go like oh in grade school batman it was uh, it was boys with earrings <laughs> in high school leather jackets <laughs> but, uh, as much as i want to see that he doesn't have the best line delivery here so i don't want him to ruin those <laughs> those words <laughs> that seems to be a recur- ever since the first movie like uh bat, bat- angle was pretty good with his the line delivery in that but then, like, the only real line in the second one was that kind of slightly flubbed, like, oh, thank you for saving the bay- day, Batman. I think the circus guy is back! Like, where it just seemed like he was just trying to get the words out too quickly and stuff. And this isn't much better. There's absolutely no believability or emotion or anything in what he's doing. I love him, though. He's clearly been told to do it this way. So no. that's fine, because we've seen him do that. Mm. I do like though if they, uh, if they they could have had if, they, if it was that like Chase and Gordon combined were, were planning this ambush of Batman the seduction that like they could have had a throwback like when Batman clears off and he could have been like God damn it we had him oh it right there <laughs> <laughs> and he should he should drop his uh, his robe oh yeah like, oh, that's oh, why he's God. wearing the robe he's planning like the pajamas will suggestively <laughs> become unbuttoned as the scene goes on and stuff. <laughs> What if my robe fell to the floor? <laughs> Only kidding. The Batman's is like, what is happening? <laughs> like, <laughs> l- elastic waistband pajamas, you know, just like show, oh. pop a little like old man hip out there for you. And... Oh, yeah. <laughs> it pops it a little too a much. He's like, oh, no, that's, that's going to require a hospital visit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, poor Gordon. Uh. Uh. Oh, we're growing to love Gordon because we complain about how incompetent he is throughout the whole series. But like, we get a lot of material out of that guy. Yep. So. As incompetent as he is at this point, I wouldn't change it for the world. <laughs> I do wonder though, like uh, the fact that Chase has brought up Catwoman. Is this the kind of thing that would have afflicted Batman in some way? And the fact that like she's directly mentioning the woman who like he was properly in love with. And then, you know, shattered his heart and stuff. And he was, you mm. know, wanted to invite her to go live in his castle, just like a fairy tale. Well, those are the minutes you were on for last season as well, weren't they, Molly? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, yeah the yeah. whole time in. But yeah, now it's just like the fact that she's brought him, brought something up, that might be a thing of like, you know, it, it's it's going into like too soon. Kind of like, don't, don't mention, the, you know, the, the, the X to him because that's, the, you know, that's not going to attract him. It's going to just have him thinking about like, oh, yeah. That really, really hurt me <laughs> really, really badly. Yeah. That's not a way to win someone into your bed or your heart. Like, you don't bring mm. up the ex in a sexy moment. It's like, ah. Oh, mm. Remember that woman you were banging before? I don't know <laughs> your, what happened with her, but. <laughs> and Batman should be more be like, how do you know this? How do you know that I was I was dating Catwoman? Because I'm Poison Ivy. <laughs> <laughs> 
that could have been a twist then, because like, Poison Ivy does have like all the hypnotism kind of powers. Maybe she seduced Selena and stuff, yep, got all the yep. info out of her, but oh well. <laughs> was not to yeah. be. If only yeah. they'd come to us to write this movie. Mm. Granted, when this came out, I was 10? Yeah. <laughs> like going to eight year olds. I could also argue that this film was written by eight year olds and it's delivered. <laughs> yeah. itself, but... It feels like it. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, I actually do feel a little bit bad for Chase, though, in terms of like, because Gordon's come up and just like, oh, what the hell's going on here and stuff. And, she, you know, she's also getting, you know, uh, cock blocked in a, a certain way. <laughs> but it's also the fact that like, this could be kind of embarrassing, too, that like you were trying, there's no way to hide what she was doing. Like, she's up there in this, you know, silky nighty and stuff. And she's, you know, freaking grinding right into Batman here at the beginning of the minute. And, like, there's no way Gordon's not going to be like, you were trying to. You were trying to get off with Batman, and it didn't work and stuff. Like, it was just, I feel a little bad for it in that it would be kind of embarrassing. Like, she never indicates that, because she's just like, another, you know, quiet old man. Silencio old man. <laughs> just like, looking after Batman as he jumps off the building and stuff. Hey, you could you could make something up. You could say, I was trying to seduce him to get knowledge out of him for the case. <laughs> <laughs> and Gordon's like, oh, that's not a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> I had the same idea. That's why I came. <laughs> But that's a really good point that you're making because, like, she just moved here. She's on the payroll. They're paying her to consult, right? So imagine, She's consulting. right? Somebody, right, right. Air quotes. But imagine you've been hired. You live somewhere else in a different city, say Metropolis, whatever. And you leave your private practice. You get hired on by Gotham to come in to consult. You've been on the job for a half a minute. And you're already like basically a sexual harassment case within a government agency. It's kind of ridiculous. It doesn't look good, does it? Yeah, that is true. Like it could be like the rest of the movie is like, oh, Chase Marinian is no longer working on the Batman case. <laughs> Surely, actually, they would have to take her off this. Yeah, yeah, because very blatantly, like she is like my. It's not entirely professional. Her interest in Batman. I was like, well, it's supposed to be. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's kind of like if she would have just hit the fire alarms, like, within, you know, City Hall, and just to get a bunch of firemen up in there so she could kind of pick and choose. I mean, this is kind of the equivalent of that. Like, you're it messing is, with... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, my God. <laughs> I, th- I, kept, I keep thinking as well, though, the fact that, like, Batman says, like, oh, false alarm. And she's like, oh, is it? I keep thinking, that is that a, a premature ejaculation joke? Or am I reading way too much into it? Oh my god, what? I just, I was like, it, it, it feels like it's kind of halfway towards being one, but also maybe it's just I've just got a very filthy mind. I think it's you. Like, I mean, no. it would, if, if he had said to her, like, you know, I don't know, this is over, and she could go, what, already? <laughs> <laughs> I don't but know, it, false, you know, false alarm, like, oh, is it? <laughs> like, I don't know, for some reason, I just felt like that's what they were going for to me, but... Oh, absolutely. It totally seems like a couple of teenagers like that got caught given a handy, you know, and dad <laughs> walks in. That's kind of the vibe that it has. <laughs> oh, I've never thought of it that way. Oh, my God, Niall. I don't know if you've improved the scene or made it worse. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but yeah, then Batman makes his very dramatic exit. Like, the most dude. unnecessary exit in history. <laughs> Surely he's just doing this to look cool to Chase, right? It's a flirtation. Mm-hmm. There's no other reason he does this. Well, the thing is that maybe he's torn, but like, well, if she was just here because I'm trying to put her off, I would exit in a kind of more subtle way. But I also really need to look cool in front of Gordon because he <laughs> he kind of thinks I'm the best, you know? So, <laughs> And it he's, does look cool as hell. Like, Gordon is essentially like if anyone's seen Brooklyn Nine-Nine. <laughs> Like, Gordon is Boyle, and friggin' Batman is, uh, you know, Andy Samberg's character. <laughs> just like, he just thinks he is awesome. Awesomeness and personified. But Oh, he is. Th- this thing, though, maybe you can answer this, Molly. Because like, Batman jumps off, and he goes through, there's a bridge. And for some reason, this bridge has three large holes in its roof. So Batman can jump down through them. And I can't think why it would. And if that's a thing that's standard practice in bridges, in, if you're driving around, or what, what, what did, did this perturb anyone else? Or is it just I me? assumed it was the like the the side of the bridge, you know, not the bridge itself, you know, mm. like the 
the edges. Mm. But I don't know. It is a bit weird. I presumed it was a railway that was a bridge with rails on both sides. Oh. I don't know. Did you guys ever play Ark? Because I know, John, you're you're a gamer. Did you ever play Arkham Asylum? Oh, like the- yes. Yeah, like there's a lot of like train tracks and it's kind of Christmassy and well, I think it has more of a Batman Returns vibe, but there's there's a lot of bridge, train bridgey stuff. Mm, so that's mm. what I was kind of thinking. Maybe that's what it was referencing. It's oh. got to be something like that, right? Because it, I don't know, it looks weird. But you're right, it isn't even the side. I'm looking at it again. It is just the middle. Yeah. I completely misunderstood what I was looking at. <laughs> uh, they are the holes. Yeah. Whoa, mm. What the? Um, um, also... I have to say, Batman doesn't learn. Like, one of the major set pieces of the previous movie was people stealing the Batmobile <laughs> and running around a rabbit with it. Later on in this movie, someone steals the Batmobile. <laughs> and the, he, no freaking wonder, he's left it lying open, and apparently all you have to do to turn it on is just press a button. Like, why would you do that? <laughs> is he just like, oh, the penguin's dead. That'll never happen again. <laughs> like, I'm totally safe. <laughs> Maybe it only activates when it detects the right buttocks on the seat. <laughs> <laughs> Except for Dick Grayson. How's he faked the bum? Oh, maybe he's mm. just been, he's been examining Bruce Wayne's ass groove and in, in the sofa yeah. and stuff. He's like, oh, I got it. I got it down. He's took a print of the ass groove and yeah. he's laid it down. 3D printed it up. And, uh... <laughs> I bet Batman has a 3D printer. Oh, yeah. Back even in 95, it's like, oh, ahead of the curve. Had the yeah. mini bat signal beepers <laughs> that he was trying to get off the ground. And he, freaking 3D printers. That's how he kept his fortune rolling. Min- yeah. The beepers. Mm. <laughs> we, we all had a bat beeper back in the 90s. <laughs> However, I did have the, the car as a phone. Really? When this came out, I did. And it lit oh. up. It was epic. So, like, oh, it was cool. like the actual car, and then you would... Um, like flip it over to talk so like the basically the handset was the underside of the vehicle and then you had like the keys and then you know the like the talky space <laughs> on the other side of it and then it had a little button so because it was sitting down presumably on something flat so it was hung up mm. so when you you know lifted it up off the table then the little button would uh, un- undepress and it was uh, yeah it was amazing. stellar i so. take it this was like a proper old like a, a corded phone it was not like a mobile phone or anything Correct. Yes. Yeah. Yes, kids listening. Phones used to be stationary and attached to the wall. <laughs> Would it be safe to assume then from that, Molly? Because I've been going through with the guests the whole season. And I feel like I'm, I've been alone so far. And I think this is an amazing Batmobile. I really, really love it. And a lot of other people have no time for it. So <gasps> are, how do you feel really? about this? I love it. I think it's amazing. Oh, there you go. There you go. We've got one. I've got one on board with me. Who doesn't I'm in like the middle, it? though. I, we've had some people hate it. I'm of the opinion that it's it's uh, fine. It looks a bit like a toy with a cheap fin. It just wobbles <laughs> all over the place. But um, it's okay. I think it would work better in a comic book. I think visually in a comic book, this big stupid fin would look great. Yeah. I am kind of slightly gutted in that, like, I mean, so far, because they're still making it, I guess, but, like, the uh, Sean Gordon Murphy White Knight uh, series had Batman giving, like, all his old Batmobiles to the police department, Mm. and they have, like, the Tumblr, and they have the Burton Mobile, and they have, like, the Adam West car. Not one goddamn sign of the Schumacher, Val Kilmer Batmobile. (gasps) That's shocking. That's hurtful. Yeah, it's quite iconic, and this was a huge movie. Yeah. Maybe someone's just like, uh, Sean Gardner Murphy was just like, I wanted that phone and I never got it. So it's, ah. it's too much to have to, to have to draw that every time. I saw some girl come in the store and buy the last one from in front of my eyes. <laughs> uh, I and think of course- name was Molly something. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's amazing. And I, you know, I know I'm going to piss some people off, but I think this is better than the Tumblr by Ooh. a long shot. Ooh. I see, like, I'm actually getting bored with it as well, because the Tumblr to me is like, it's good for what it's doing. Like, it's supposed to be kind of a tank. That's it. it, it never, I never was just like, oh, I wish I had the Tumblr. It was like, because it doesn't look cool. It just looks like a big blob with loads of <laughs> shards sticking out of it and stuff. Whereas this <laughs> looks cool to me. So It's very I'm, gothic, this. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Which is weird. You'd think Burton would have done the gothic one. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. 
I do yeah. wonder, I wonder if Tim Burns ever come out and made any statements about the Schumacher Batmobile. Like, oh, that Batmobile's good. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, oh, God damn it, I wish I had done that third one. If I only had known. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, of course, then Batman comes out with the uh, line I do kind of wish they'd cut where he's just like, ah, women. <laughs> it's just like, I know. Well, like, why? That, why's uh, that there? Cool off on the casual sexism, dude. Come on. Mm-hmm. Right. That's not good. Because maybe you could be like, oh, this happened with Vicky Vale. But then it only, it only happened with Vicky Vale. It did the same thing didn't happen with Selena Kyle. So it's like, well, you can rope in all women. And this going to be like, oh, they're always after Batman. Unless yeah. unless there is like, oh, we, have, we haven't seen the countless women who've been throwing themselves at Batman. Like, you know, unbeknownst to uh, the audience. But Even so... He- he seems there to be of the opinion, oh, women, they're all crazy. Yeah. They're all yeah. thinking with their heart. <laughs> yeah. So it's, uh, well, Chase Meridian, I don't think she's thinking with her heart. She's, oh, well, yeah. She's oh, thinking yeah. with, her, uh, with her hips, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> it's all in the hips. I just, I don't know. I, I, I've never had a, a real strong sense that Bruce Wayne slash Batman had a lot of natural feminine relationships, friendships or otherwise. And, mm. and so this comment, you know, I, I feel as as much as it's like really tone deaf culturally, kind of makes sense given the fact that he has a lot of limited feminine relationship experience. Hmm. Oh, fair yeah. enough. Yeah, I suppose he doesn't really have any any friends, let alone female friends. Yeah, it's just him and Alfred. Yeah. Although he does yeah. have Margaret, I guess he has his assistant in this. Who again? We kind of, I guess, we get a lose that they have a relationship in terms of the, the fact that he's she she's, seems to be his personal assistant, but. Hmm. You know. Like it could be completely business type though. That's just more like yeah, Margaret. I, it, it might be one of those sort of like a Christmas like oh yeah, here's you know two hundred dollar bonus, buy yourself something nice kind of thing. Like it could be that has no actual personal relationship with her at all. But um, yeah, but yeah, it, uh, you know, it, I'm sure back in 1995 this was like oh harmless line. But nowadays it's like nah, but you should have cut that. That's that's not adding anything good yeah. to, to the film. Mm. Um. But then, uh, but then, then we cut back into uh, Wayne Enterprises, and sparks are flying uh, as, as Edward Nigma is, is working on something. We know fine rightly what it is, but we don't see it in this minute what he's working on. But what could it be, Niall? I have no idea. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll <laughs> maybe we'll find out next time. Ooh, we see sparks. Uh, we hear manic laughter. Ooh, yeah. It must be something evil. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if I like that. The whole the fact that he. He kind of goes like, Whoa! <laughs> like he's, like he, <laughs> you know, the, the kind of the gibbering laugh after he's kind of frightened himself and stuff. It's just, yeah, I don't know. I, I know he's going for crazy mad scientist, but again, I'm sure we'll be saying this a lot throughout the rest of the season. <laughs> but like Jim Carrey, could have dialed it back a little bit. I feel, <laughs> yeah, but basically every scene you could uh, say that. <laughs> But again, we'll be talking a lot about Jim Carrey next minute. So, uh, unless you guys do have anything you want to say about this minute in particular, no, I'm all noted out again. Okay. Nope. Yeah, let's, let's. I'm I'm happy to move on if you guys are. Yes. Well, uh, Molly, once again, before we go, would you like to tell people where they can find your shows on the interwebs? Yes. Uh, Cabin Minute Cast is uh, cabinminutecast.com, and Escape from New York Minute is on growlermedia.com, and currently um we have a we have i'm got we're almost done with the run but um we had the absolute pleasure to interview dean cundy who is a cinematographer and i would wager anyone has seen at least one of his movies uh he was a cinematographer on escape from new york minute or escape from new york excuse me and um, Jurassic Park and the um, Back to the Future movies and Halloween. And he's just done an amazing amount of work and he was an absolute delight. So we have that interview up um, to check out. Um, and, and I think it's just great for, you know, any creative to listen to him because he's a very accomplished dude and he was very generous with us. And uh, I think anyone who loves movies and is a creative person would get a lot out of it. So uh, you can check that out on growlermedia.com and we're on Twitter at NY minute pod hey, awesome hell yeah that's a that's a great get that's amazing it was yeah yeah he was he was super sweet we're very very grateful that he spent the time with us he was super generous with his time well even though he has nothing to do with this movie now i'll book him <laughs> <laughs> it's fine we'll get him i'm still uh, wanting dude, to go because like the 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 turtles minute guys they got partners in crime 
Yeah. And partners in crime like started liking some of our tweets randomly. And, like, they did, yeah. They got nothing to do with that, Mac. Can we get partners in crime on the podcast? <laughs> they could do our theme song <laughs> next season. <laughs> hey, it's worth a shot. But uh, do check that out and come and speak to us on Facebook at the Bat Minute Listener's Cave. Or uh, we're on Instagram at the Bat Minute. And we have a website, thebatminute.com. You can find all the episodes and there's links to stuff. There's links to our tea public. You can come and buy a t-shirt. Ooh, yeah, you'll look super cool. You'll be the talk of Paris Fashion Week. So go <laughs> buy one there and we'll see you again on Friday for more Bat Minute Forever. Next time. Holy percolating perp, a reign of terror kicks off via cafetiere as an office interloper is captured through coffee to the cranium. But despite a momentary respite between his mocha malay and a mandatory mind manipulation, is there something fishy about this stickly situation? Find out Friday. Same bat pod, different bat minute. <laughs>